Well, hello everybody, Dave here, and if you've stuck with me this long through the first six chapters, you're in for a real treat, because this is the last foundational chapter that you need in statistics in order to be able to use significance testing to its full extent. Uh, sampling distribution seems like a fairly simple thing, but at the same time it is vital in our understanding of the models that we use moving forward. So to start off with, we have to understand that with statistics, again, we're dealing with this cycle of understanding. And the entire course thus far has been focused on taking a population, selecting a meaningful sample from it, collecting that data that's representative of the population, doing some calculations, and then from that being able to make an inference about the population. And as we've gone through this course, we've learned different things about the way that we sample and the way that we calculate. But what we really haven't understood is how do we create a meaningful distribution such that we can begin to formulate this inference about the population? We certainly know that randomness is a factor. We just learned in the previous chapter that the 10% condition matters. In statistics, more is better, but too much is a bad thing. And the reason for that is because we need the, to satisfy this idea of independence for us to be able to believe that our model could eventually be a normal distribution. But again, what distribution are we actually trying to determine to be normal? And for that, we have to understand a little bit of the language first. And I've referenced to this throughout the entire course. But now that we're talking about population and samples separately, we're going to need to make sure that we remember that if we're dealing with a parameter, which is going to be labeled using the Greek letters of mu or sigma or something to that effect, or a script letter P to represent a proportion, uh, we're talking about something that's specific to the population. However, if we're talking about a statistic, now we're going to be referring to those English letters with decorations like P hat or X bar, and that's going to represent a calculated value from a sample itself. And so this differential here is going to be vital because in a lot of cases we're going to be given some information about the population, but then we're going to have to understand a particular observation from a sample itself and what it is that we do with that p hat or that x bar. So it may make sense that within sampling we're going to end up taking a bunch of samples, but each sample may not necessarily end up being the same amount. Again, despite our best efforts, when we talk about a sample being representative, if we're performing something, for example, like a regular SRS, there is every potential that each grouping of 30 uh, is not necessarily representative of the of the population, but we're trying really hard to make it that way. And so if we expect a proportion of, say, red M&Ms in a package of M&Ms, and we expect it to be 0.2, well, the first sample we might get 0.1, the second sample we might get 0.3. So there's going to be this variability associated with the sampling, but the question is, does that mean that we're not getting the right result? Does this mean that we'll never actually find out that the true proportion of red in that particular package was 0.2, or whatever the case may be? And then perhaps if we get a systematic number that's far away from this expected value, uh, do we then say that that expected value is perhaps not the real value, that we need to invoke some sort of further study to determine what that proportion actually is? This is a really important understanding because now when we take samples, it's not that one sample is going to be the answer. It's that a bunch of samples is going to lead us to an answer with the expectation that there's some variability associated with these samples, but there should be some systematic grouping that we see that allows us to make a meaningful conclusion. And so from this, we're talking about something known as the sampling distribution. And the sampling distribution is literally taking our statistics, our X bars or our P hats, and instead of graphing the frequency of P or X, or in, in the population case, mu or script P, uh, we're actually going to graph P hat and X bar on the horizontal axis and count the number of those that we receive. Because what we're going to see from a sampling distribution is down the road, we'll find out that if all those conditions that I've been talking about have been met and random selection has taken place, the 10% condition and then the large counts condition, the idea that n times p and n times 1 minus p both have to be greater than or equal to 10 in the case of proportions, and we'll talk about means in a later lesson, if all of those conditions are satisfied, as we select more and more and more and more samples, this distribution is going to form. And once this distribution forms, 
we're actually going to be able to use some of those tools that we've learned in previous chapters, specifically anything pertaining to the normal distribution, in order to calculate the probability of anything being farther away from the center than the actual observation we have. And by that, we're starting to use the language of a significance test. So the sampling distribution is a created distribution from multiple samples. We're going to talk about three different distributions now. We're going to talk about the population distribution, which we've played with in previous chapters, the distribution of the sample, which is a, a less meaningful distribution because we're talking about specifically from a given sample, what does it look like? But most importantly, the sampling distribution, where we take these statistics, where we get those X bars, those P hats, we graph them all and count them up. And what we're going to see is this very common shape forming. And of course, I think you've all figured out by now, we're talking about the normal distribution. So these three distributions are going to be something that you need to be able to tell the difference between. It is highly unlikely that you're ever going to be asked to physically make a distribution of the sample, but that being said, notice that all we've done is literally flip the words from set distribution of the sample to sampling distribution, but they mean very different things. So these three distributions are going to be the essence of our significance testing that we do moving forward. If we do this from a graphical uh, representation, let's imagine that we have a bunch of chips, some blue, some red, and let's say that we have an even number of those so that the parameter of interest, which in our case is going to be the proportion of, of a given chip, is going to be 0.5. Well, you can see then that if we take an SRS of 20 from each, remember an SRS by definition is that it, all groupings of n individuals have the same chance of being selected. Remember, that's different from an SRS, meaning that all individuals have an equal chance of being selected. It's not true. SRS is focused on the groupings, not the individual. So when you take a look at this graphic, you can see that we're taking an SRS of 20 every single time with the idea that we're not going to replace uh, so that hopefully our uh, condition of independence has been satisfied, which is, of course, the 10% condition. You can see um, in this case that you get three different P hats or uh, sample proportions, and you can see that none of them actually represent 0.5. But if you take all of the samples and you keep sampling and you keep sampling and you graph p hat on the horizontal and you count up the number of p hats you have for the particular value, you can see the distribution on the right that's forming sure looks a lot like a normal distribution to me. Now, it's not exactly normal yet, but you got to remember, of course, in statistics, everything is about the idea of estimation and approximation. But in this case, you can see the full extent of the distributions we were talking about. The population distribution is, a, is an even split of blue chips and red chips. But when we actually start doing the sampling, you can see that we get a variation or a sampling variability uh, in the distributions of the sample. But if you take those statistics, p hats, and you graph them, what you get in the sampling distribution is a very structured distribution uh, that we will eventually liken to a normal distribution. So when you're describing a sampling distribution, this is the first time that we're going to have a significant piece of evidence that is trying to measure um, the significance of the center of the population itself. And from this, we have to understand the difference between a biased and an unbiased estimator. And it would make sense that if you look at this distribution, you can see that the center of our sampling distribution is right smack dab on the middle of 0.5 which is exactly what we expected from the population. Now, the distribution does not have to look like the population distribution, and the sampling distribution will likely never necessarily look like that population. You could have something that's bimodal. You could have something that's uniform. But the nature of the sampling, the random sampling, the 10% condition, the large counts uh, condition, as we build the sampling distribution, regardless of the look of the population, we should end up with this very uniform a uh, single peak uh, thing that we still aren't ready to call a normal distribution yet, but we're getting pretty close. But from this distribution, we can see that that center is right smack dab on the, on the 0.5 value, which we were expecting from the population itself. If that center were shifted, if it were 0.6, if it were 0.4, and it was very systematic in its shift, uh, we would say that there's a bias associated. It's not necessarily 
going to be true that the shape of the distribution is going to be different, but it's going to be where that center lies. So when we speak of something being a biased or an unbiased estimator, if we expected the proportion of red chips to be 0.5, and we have a center of a sampling distribution that is on 0.5 or close, we would consider that an unbiased estimator. If, however, we think of a, a biased estimator, if we expected the proportions to be 0.5, but we ended up with something like 0.3, in that case, we'd now consider uh, that estimator as a biased estimator, because now we have reason to believe that that center uh, is not actually lining up with the value we would expect. If we think about it in terms of the sample size, if you'll remember in the previous chapter, we talked about the idea that more is better. And we're going to dig into this a lot more as we move through the chapter, but the basic idea behind this is more is better, but too much is a bad thing because it would satisfy the 10% condition. Uh, in the case of all uh, estimation techniques. So when you take a look here, if we, if we see a sampling of 100 versus a sampling of 1,000, you can see that both distributions line up exactly on 0.37, which is the point of a sampling distribution. That being said, you can see that the variability in the sampling distribution on the left is quite a bit larger than the variability of the sampling distribution on the right. And all that means is, is that when you do multiple samplings, if you have a lower sample size, it's going to take longer for that distribution to converge on that center that we're looking for, in this case 0.37. However, on the right-hand side, you can see that we have this distribution that converged rather quickly on 0.37 because we were taking a sample size of 1,000. So from a logistics point of view, it makes sense to do samplings of 100. It just seems easier to deal with. However, there's an obvious advantage when you take a sample size of 1,000 because now you converge on that parameter of interest much faster so that when we have to make a meaningful conclusion, uh, we will have definitive evidence much faster with our larger sample size. And so when we're talking about the variability of a statistic, uh, we feel pretty good about our results so long as the sample size is at least uh, a tenth of the population, or again, we're satisfying the 10% condition. Because remember, the 10% condition's purpose is to verify the independence of the sampling. The idea that the sample size is not so large that we are drastically changing the proportions of the population itself. Remember that as soon as you sample without replacement, we are technically changing uh, the fraction or the proportion of interest. But what we're saying is so long as our sample size is small enough, uh, we don't have to worry about that, that whatever changes actually exist for that proportion uh, change from a sampling, it's not going to be significant enough to overly change our results. So variability is important. A sample size needs to be large, but too large is a bad thing because our models will break down in that case. And the last thing I want to point out is, again, this idea of bias versus accuracy and the idea of variability. And so we have here four targets to consider. And the target A shows something that's highly biased. If our goal is to hit the bullseye, you can see that we have a very tight grouping but far away from where we expected. That would be considered a biased estimator because we have a very nice grouping, but it's way off of where we expected. If you take a look at B, you can see that the dots are not so grouped together. They're far more varied, but they are all generally centered around that parameter of interest, which in our case is the bullseye. So in that case, it has low bias because it's centered around that bullseye, but high variability because the points aren't very tight together. You can see now with C and D, we're doing the same thing, but obviously with high bias and variability or no bias or low bias and low variability. So our ultimate goal, of course, is to get a target like D. Uh, but that being said, it is highly likely that you end up with something a little more like B, just simply by the nature of sampling and studies itself. So this idea of bias and variability are important because just because something's biased doesn't mean it's highly variable. And just because it's highly variable doesn't mean that it's highly biased. And so the idea of, of seeing the sampling distribution as something that's more spread out as opposed to tight together, and to notice that the center of the sampling distribution, which the goal of the center of the sampling distribution is to be centered on that parameter of interest, which in our case is going to be script P or mu, uh, 
once we have that distribution that contains low variability and uh, is an unbiased estimator, then we recognize that in, in case of our study, we have a fairly good representation to allow us to make what will inevitably be a meaningful statistical inference. So folks, that's it for the first lesson. We're now going to break off into what happens if we have categorical data and what happens if we have quantitative data. And you're going to see that we're going to deal with things in a very similar fashion, but also in a different fashion, especially when we're dealing with sample means. So we'll see you again.